welcome again, everyone, to episode seven of Methodologies for Greenhouse Gas Baselines and Monitoring in the Transport Sector, today on interurban rail infrastructure expansion. And before we begin, I'd like to give you a little bit of background on the passenger and freight transport volume of the Compendium on Greenhouse Gas Baselines and Monitoring, which is a publication we did together with the UNFCCC Secretariat. The Compendium has several volumes, and the one on transport covers eight chapters, each looking at a different mitigation action type, from mass rapid transit investments, to vehicle efficiency improvements, to fuel pricing, in also including interurban rail infrastructure, which is what we'll look at in more detail today. If you've missed any of our last webinars that we did last year, all of them are online on changingtransport.org. And also a copy of this presentation is already available to you in the handout section that you can find in the control panel. In the control panel, you have several options. Uh, the one I really would like to point out is the questions pane because all of you are muted and to, dis, uh, to avoid any noise disturbance. So please, if you have any questions, just type them in the questions pane and send them to us. We'll have a Q&A session at the end after all of the presentations and uh, we will pick up your questions as we go along. And so whenever you come across anything, please just type them in at any moment in time and send to us. We are looking forward to 60 minutes after a short introduction on my behalf on the transport volume and what to expect from it. Eduardo will present on CDM methodologies for interurban rail and then Jörg will give us a real world application example for high speed rail uh, in Korea. And then we should have around 20 minutes left for questions and answers. So, as I mentioned already, we have two speakers. Jörg Grütter is probably familiar to many of you. He's uh, the COO of Grütter Consulting and is an economist that has been working on sustainable transport uh, for 25 years, linking more than 300 transport projects successfully to climate finance. He has also, in, with his uh, company, developed uh, a lot of greenhouse gas transport methodologies, including a lot of uh, CDM methodologies, and for interurban rail has applied them uh, both in India and Bangladeshi railways, as well in, as the high-speed rail in Korea. And Eduardo is a chemical engineer who's been working with the UNFCCC Secretariat for around 10 years now. And prior to that, he has also already been developing clean development mechanism projects. So he's a real CDM expert uh, in particular in energy efficiency and transport. So I would like to give you a little bit of a glimpse basically of the transport volume, what can you expect from it? And in this case of chapter five, which looks at interurban rail. And all of the chapters are organized in the same uh, structure, starting with a description and characteristics of the mitigation action type, in this case, interurban rail investments. And of course, interurban rail investments, they have a large mitigation potential by substituting trips that might otherwise be done by cars or by uh, trucks, if we talk about freight transport, or by aviation, when we, especially when we talk about high-speed rail connections. So um, we believe that interurban rail investments are one important uh, measure when we look at the whole policy package of mitigation transport emissions. So this is the first section. Then uh, we look at the structure of the mitigation effects, how to determine baselines and calculating emission reductions for uh, interurban rail in chapter five, and then provide guidance on selecting analysis tools that are already existent. And Section five then looks at monitoring, which indicators to monitor at what time intervals. And last chapter provides an example. In this case, uh, it provides a short description of the India Railways NAMA. Uh, 
And so what we did is to uh, include in each of the chapters a causal chain that allows you a quick access to the var variables that are targeted by the mitigation action and the components um, and how they should be affected uh, in theory. So uh, in this case, it's a little, it's actually quite complex depending on the methodology. It, uh, there's, uh, it's a little bit uh, easier. And then you can see, you see the actions like new passenger rail infrastructure affecting uh, the, the shift part of mitigation action. So shifting uh, to rail. So this uh, should increase, of course, the, the mode share of rail and decrease, for instance, the road share. Uh, in rail. And then you see also the indicators uh, that are necessary to look at when monitoring these interventions and the effects that it's finally having uh, on fuel consumption and greenhouse gas emissions. Then regarding uh, the structure of mitigation effects, we also always look at boundary setting and the boundaries can be very different depending, of course, on your particular project you're looking at. So they can be either national uh, expansion projects or regional or even just specific rail corridors you're looking at in, with different time intervals and uh, important to say that also to consider the upstream uh, emissions from the energy sector depending on whether it's electrified rail or uh, still diesel powered. Then it can affect both passenger and freight transport as already mentioned and of course uh, mostly looking at CO2 equivalents, but may also include uh, CH4 and N2O emission equivalents. Then in the guidance part, I want to uh, just point out that we always include this navigation map to help users judge the level of accuracy of the existing methodologies. And also based on the objective of the analysis can already have a, like, a quick access to which methodologies might be suitable uh, for their particular purpose. But in addition to that, then uh, the guide includes uh, tabular descriptions of all of the existing methodologies for that particular mitigation action type uh, that exists. And they are linked so that you can then find the detailed information for each of the tools when you follow the links. So that is basically how the uh, transport volume is organized for all of the mitigation action types. And uh, with that, I would already like to thank you for your attention and hand over to Eduardo to give us more detailed inputs on the CDM methodologies. Thank you, Wurda, and welcome everyone to the webinar. Okay. Ah, now, yes, okay. So, uh, just before jumping into the, uh, the methodologies, I want to give a snapshot of the CDM in the transport sector. Uh, to date, there are 21 approved methodologies between large scale and small scale, involving modal shifts of passenger transportation, modal shift in freight transportation, energy efficiency measures and technologies, uh, electric vehicles, aviation, production of biodiesel, and there are three methodologies too that serve as uh, supporting tools to the approved methodologies. Uh, one is to calculate the emissions from transportation of freight, and the other two are to calculate baseline emissions uh, for mode of shifting cargo transport or and in passenger transport. With uh, respect to the projects, there are 30 projects registered to date. Most of them are in the urban passenger transportation. 20 involving mode of shifting passengers such as BRTs, MRTS, cable cars, etc. Seven involving uh, fuel switching and electric vehicles. Two involving the production of biodiesel and one involving the mode of shifting freight transport from road to rail. I'll talk a little bit about this project at the end of the presentation. And one registered POA which involves the mode of shifting freight transportation also from road to rail. Uh, on this presentation, I'm going to talk specifically about two methodologies, AM90, which, is, which involves the mode of shift of cargo, and AM101, which is the high-speed passenger rail systems. So the methodology has some applicability criteria, and I would like to, oh, sorry. Uh, so with the methodologies for mode of shift in transportation of cargo from road to water or rail, 
typical projects involve the transportation of cargo using barges, ships, or trains. And the baseline scenario is that the cargo will be transported by road using trucks, and the project scenario is the change of the transportation modes to barge, ships, or trains. Uh, with respect to the uh, specificities of the methodology, I'd like to highlight uh, two relevant applicability criteria. Uh, that's only one type of cargo is allowed to be transported between the baseline and the project. Mixing of cargo is not being allowed, and the distance of, of the baseline trip route, including the region and destination, has to remain the same uh, throughout the project lifetime. Baseline emissions represent the emissions that would have happened if the same amount of cargo was transported by road and is determined based on the cargo transported during the crediting period, during the project lifetime, the distance traveled, forward and return trips, and they shall remain uh, fixed, as indicated previously, and a baseline emission factor, which is that is determined as the amount of CO2 emitted to transport one ton kilometer of a specific type of cargo. The emission factor, the baseline emission factor, can be determined either uh, based on historical data of fuel and cargo transported, length of the route trip, or assume a default conservative value for the different types of cargo transported. And the methodology provides a list of conservative default factors for different types of cargo. And just give an example of 80 grams of CO2 per ton kilometers to transport metal products by, by road. The project emissions are determined based on the fuel and electricity consumed by the trains and fuel consumed by trucks in complementary routes, meaning uh, transport uh, cargo by truck from the production plant, for example, to the point of departure of the ships, the barges, or the train, and uh, return trips, and from the point of arrival of the ships, barges, trains, to the destination point of the cargo, including the return trip. Uh, to determine emission reductions, the necessary to monitor the amount of cargo transported, and the fuel and electricity consumed by the trains or trucks in the project scenario. Now, uh, moving to AM101, which is the passing, which is the high-speed rail systems. Uh, this methodology is applicable for projects that involve the mode of shift in the interurban transportation of passengers. Baseline scenario uh, is that passengers are transported between cities by buses, trains, cars motorcycles or airplanes, and a typical project involves shifting the mode of transportation to high-speed uh, rail systems. Again, uh, I'd like to highlight now four relevant criteria to this methodology. First is the projects involving a new or extension of existing high-speed rail system or replacement or upgrading of an existing conventional rail system to high-speed rail system are eligible. Uh, the average design speed of the trains between uh, two cities shall be at least 200 kilometers per hour. The average distance between two consecutive stations shall be at least 20 kilometers. And of course, it's only allowed for interurban transportation. For transportation of passengers inside the city, the methodology is not valid. Uh, baseline emissions represent emissions that would have happened if passengers used other modes, for example, the bus or the cars or the rail conventional rail, motorcycle, or airplane to travel, and it's determined based on the distance passengers would have traveled and the baseline emission factor that is determined as the amount of CO2 emitted to transport one passenger kilometer through each of the different transportation modes. And this emission factor can be determined either based on historical group of passengers transported, fuel electricity consumed by the modes of transport, the baseline mode of transport, the average occupancy of the mode of the transport or based on studies or based on default emission factors. For example, for flights shorter than 500 kilometers, a default emission factor of 140 grams of CO2 per passenger kilometer is recommended. Then project emissions are determined based on the fuel and electricity consumed by the high-speed train and the fuel electricity consumed based on emissions from the rail entry station to the high-speed uh, train entry station and from the high-speed train exit station to the rail station. As you can see here in the figure, there are direct and indirect project emissions. Direct project emissions represent taking a train to reach the high-speed station. You have the direct project emissions during the travel of the high-speed train and then between the exit of the high-speed train using a conventional uh, train to reach the final destination. 
is another uh, source of indirect emissions. And to determine emission reductions, it's necessary to monitor the number of passengers traveling in the high-speed train, the fuel or and electricity consumed by the train, the share of uh, project passengers or the number of passengers who would have had traveled by the relevant mode of transport in the baseline in the absence of the project and the passenger trip distance. And these two lines parameters highlighted in red, uh, they have to be determined exposed based on sampling. Uh, just quickly uh, going through the two methodological tools that are approved. Uh, first one is on the model shift for interurban cargo transport. Uh, it contains a stepwise approach to develop what is called the standardized baseline or a default emission factor, or used to calculate baseline emissions from transport projects implementing model shift measures in interurban cargo transport. And the steps you can see here on the screen. Uh, they allow the calculation of a weighted average CO2 emission factor for each type of cargo transported through the different transport modes. In other words, it allows for the termination of a standardized baseline that is a default value for a specific region or country in tons of CO2 per ton kilometer of freight uh, of the different types of modes. And similarly, there is also a methodological tool approved to determine uh, baseline emissions for model shift in urban passenger transport. It also contains a stepwise approach to develop standardized baselines or to calculate baseline emissions from transporting uh, for transport projects implementing model shift in urban passenger transport. Uh, the steps allow uh, to the calculation of a weighted average CO2 emission factor for passenger transported within an urban area through uh, the different transport modes in this area. For example, for buses, subway, uh, urban rails, cars, taxis, etc. Again, in other words, it allows the determination of a standardized baseline or a specific CO2 emission factor per passenger kilometer valid for a specific city. On the approved CDM projects, uh, I just like to, unfortunately, we have only one project registered so far using either of the two methodologies, and the project is a railway using AM90 in Chile. Uh, it involves the construction of a new rail system, which is a deviation railways to the main railway conveyor belts from the deviation railways to the loading and the loading points and new wagons to replace the transportation of cement aggregated by trucks. Uh, just some quick figures. The project applies a conservative default emission factor of 70 grams of CO2 per, of CO2 per ton kilometer and to date, we don't have any CRs issued for this project. The project has been registered, but no monitoring report has been submitted. And finally, for those uh, not familiar with the CDM methodologies, the CDM develops two uh, types of scale methodologies, large scale and small scale. And to access the methodologies, you can click in the links here displayed on the screen. A new form uh, will be displayed. and if you click here on this button show forms you can choose the methodologies on the transport sector and then click next, click apply to see the list of methodologies approved okay that will be it from my side back to you Urda. thank you very much eduardo and uh, as you can see here we can is also with us and he'll be available also for questions later on if you have questions to the CDM methodologies. And with that, uh, I think we will just continue with uh, handing over to Jörg on his presentation on the application in Korea. Okay, thank you. Uh, Basically, it's about uh, practical applications of monitoring for the high-speed rail system. We also did monitoring for interurban rail in India and Bangladesh using the methodology, in fact, for freight and for passenger transport. But this was internal within the ADB, within an ADB project. So the high-speed rail project we've been monitoring and designing is uh, a 250 kilometer high speed rail in Korea and South Korea uh, 
with an average speed of over 300 kilometers. Uh, the project was announced also to the UNFCC nearly a decade ago, then started construction and has started operations partially in 2015. The last part will start operations in 2021. So it's a, a gradual implementation. Currently some 200 kilometers are running and it replaces trips by other modes of transport. And so as mentioned previously by Eduardo, basically the, uh, we applied the methodology <clears throat> AM101, <clears throat> but it's uh, not a CDM project, it's a reg registered Korean offset project, the domestic system, which was established in South Korea and where you can make uh, national offset projects. The approval process is very similar. You have to go through a validation external, then you get the approval by government, by different ministries of the project that has all been realized. The project is a registered transport project in Korea. And then you do the monitoring reports, you do the external verification, and then you get the issuance of, in this case, Korean offset credits. So for monitoring, like Eduardo said, you, you have the electricity consumption and the number of passengers on rail, uh, on high-speed rail. This is very easy to receive as any operator will have this data. The only issue might be, in general, you separate the electricity consumption of high-speed rail from normal rail as you run it on different tracks. So this shouldn't be a problem. The core part is the passenger survey which you need to determine the baseline modes and origin destination of trips. Uh, we did that survey two times already, uh, just some results. Uh, the average trip distance uh, of passenger was around 250 kilometer of which around 100 kilometer uh, on connecting rail and 150 kilometers on average on high speed rail. Uh, the baseline modes used based on the surveys is uh, primarily bus, uh, then 30% car, 10% plane, and 10%. They would have used the uh, normal train you can also use, uh, which is uh, relatively slow. I mean, it takes a uh, double time of the bus, so that's why people would have preferred the bus or the car. Now, what's the survey feature? Uh, you have to do the survey during an entire week on the entire operation period, which means you have to randomize it, randomize the trains and randomize the passenger selection. You do the surveys on the train as uh, passengers cannot be asked on the train station because at least in Korea, you're not allowed to go on the track uh, long before the train arrives. Uh, we do two surveys every three years. We do 4,000 valid surveys. Now, that will cost you around $100,000 each year uh, because the cost per survey is around $10. That's not only in Korea. We have similar costs in most countries worldwide uh, if you do it for a professional survey company. Uh, in fact, the survey precision level is very high. We have very low coefficient of variances, much lower than demanded by the methodology, which demands 10%. We have less than 1% coefficient of variance. So the precision of the survey is very, very good. And uh, then you might ask yourself, well, why do we do 4,000 surveys two times a year uh, means 8,000 surveys. Why don't we do less? And uh, in fact, we could do only 1,000 passengers and we would still be statistically seen within the demands of the methodology. However, regulators as well as external verifiers uh, always ask for a larger sample. For example, the Korean government asked for a sample of minimum 4,000 passengers. This is not based on any statistical analysis. It's not based on any objective reason. It's a subjective uh, issue that verifiers, regulators have that they think that a small sample is not reliable. This will mean that uh, you 
the basic issue for monitoring. It's not extremely complex. The survey itself, the statistical analysis is also not hugely complex. It does require a bit of advanced statistical know-how. Uh, you have to do, for example, tests on, on uh, if the two samples are interrelated. You have to do tests on if you have uh, uh, issues of seasonality and things like that, but it's not hugely advanced. Uh, the real barrier is basically a financial barrier that it will cost you uh, to realize the two surveys. It will cost you with the statistical analysis around $100,000. So uh, the problem with the international carbon market is that with, $10, with, with 30 cents, like it's currently paid for a CR, no way you can finance that. That's also the reason why most of the CDM projects in the transport sector are not monitored anymore and have uh, are not continued anymore simply because it doesn't make financial sense. So if you don't receive something like 10 US dollar per ton offset, uh, it will probably not be worthwhile. In the case of uh, Korea, the domestic offset price is currently some $25. This project reduces some 400,000 tons per year. Uh, on, on freight, we did that for Bangladesh, we did it for India. In principle, it's much simpler. You don't require a survey. You have normally the data from the rail company on what type of goods they have transported over what distance and what weight. Uh, now, there is a uh, quite a lot of issues there after us, also with the verification agent and with the regulator that you normally do not measure the net tons. Uh, it's normally based on an average assumed tonnage, which means you normally book for freight on freight trains, you book a, an entire carriage or you book a space, you don't book a tonnage, which means, uh, and you don't weight it. That's not normal practice to weight each, uh, each uh, carriage, which means you don't actually have that data. You only have an approximate data. And then if you go to regulators, uh, which do not have a feeling for what is practice, you will have difficulties in getting it approved thereafter. So that's about monitoring, uh, open for any questions. Thanks. Thank you, Jörg. And uh, thanks also to Eduardo again. So it's time for questions. Please, uh, if you have any questions, then type them in the question pane and send them to us so that we can pick them up. And there's one question already on Chile. Uh, you presented, Eduardo, the methodology, CDM methodology, that it was uh, registered for Chile. You also mentioned so far no monitoring report was uh, handed in. Maybe can you let us know, is this also because of the low price or because of the time since it has been registered? And thirdly, do you know whether they might still monitor it and use it in their national reporting as part of the transparency reports or the biannual update reports in until 2020 biannual update reports and then on the transparency reports on NDC reporting in the future. Thanks Urda and thanks for the question. Uh, if I can scroll back to the slide of the Chile project, uh, the amount of emission reductions. Uh, yeah. You can see, sorry, yeah, you can see here that the amount of emission reductions is around 5,600 tons of CO2 per year, which is a very low volume. And combined with the low price of, uh, of the CR, that's why I assume uh, no monitoring report has been submitted uh, to date. Mm. Uh, yes, I think they can include uh, this type of projects in, in the ANAMA, it will be just a matter of understanding of the government on, on how the uh, NDC, which which sectors will be included in the NDC, and whether CDM projects 
can be carried over from the, the CDN to uh, the compliance of the NDC. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And then uh, there's also one question to Jörg, and this regards uh, the issue of electrified versus diesel uh, powered rail. Can you uh, say that in in both cases, both in India and also in Korea, was it uh, electrified rail? And do you have experience uh, comparing the emission reduction potentials uh, of electrified rail versus diesel powered rail? In the case of Korea, it's uh, electricity, high speed rail in general, or learns on electricity. You could probably use gas also. Don't think there are these locos which run 400 kilometers per hour. Uh, For high speed, yeah. The, in the case of Bangladesh, it's diesel locos. Uh, if the grid factor is higher than 0 0.6 kilograms CO2 per kilowatt hour, you will have less GHG emissions with a common rail diesel loco compared to an electric loco. So it doesn't make sense from uh, neither in India nor in fact in Bangladesh with the current grid factor to change to electric locos. Additionally, electric locos are more expensive and uh, especially also due to the overhead wiring infrastructure and maintenance of the infrastructure. So financially seen, we did evaluate that specifically for India and for Bangladesh for an ADB investment project. It doesn't make financial sense and it doesn't make CO2 sense with the current uh, grid factors. Uh, with diesel locos, even if you don't use the most efficient ones, the emission factor of Bangladesh uh, per ton kilometer of freight is 15 times lower than the truck emission factor per ton kilometer in the same country. So you're the 90% of the reduction is because shifting a road to rail uh, then you could get some additional reduction shifting from diesel to electric trains in case you have a clean grid. But the major issue is shifting road to rail. Okay, thank you. That was very uh, informative and quite impressive numbers. Um, actually, but I may add, in because we also work in Kenya, and in Kenya the standard gauge railway is diesel powered, and there we've actually looked at uh, the mitigation potential um, as part of our project activities. And in the case of Kenya, since the grid emission factor is quite uh, low because they have uh, over 70% renewable energy, it would actually make a big difference and substantially increase the mitigation potential to electrify rail as it's currently diesel powered. Then I would like to pick up uh, the other questions. There's one question to everyone that reads how is induced demand taken into account so the extra demand for instance generated by the high-speed rail infrastructure in in korea and also whether uh, the am0101 methodology has been applied uh, in korea yeah well uh, first of all, yes, it has been applied. It has been they, the methodology has been approved by the government as also Korean offset methodology, and then the project has been registered. The monitoring reports have been realised, and currently uh, it's under verification for the issuance of CR of of Korean offset uh, offset credits. So it is a registered project. You can look it up under the KOC system. Uh, induced passengers, you ask in the questionnaire, you ask the passengers if they have shifted their workspace or their uh, living space due to the rail system. You also ask them if they would not have realized the trip in absence of the rail system. Then you check if the change of the work and uh, of the trip structure be, uh, with the old living or work site and the new living or work site would have resulted in additional emission reductions or not. Now in practice with the monitoring, this was 0.3% of the 
passengers, which could have been uh, considered as induced. Of these 0 0.3, in fact, this resulted in additional emission reductions and not in leakage as the people, in fact, uh, reduced their total trip distance by moving closer to the rail. So it was not an induced trip as an additional trip. It was just that they moved uh, the, the living space. Uh, an induced trip in high-speed rail is very uncommon. High-speed rail is quite expensive. It's more expensive in the case of Korea than a plane flight. It's more expensive than any other mode of transport. So you won't do it just for the fun of doing it. Uh, you do it because you want to go from A to B. Okay, thank you. And um, that's actually, I guess, one of the problems that we're discussing also in Germany regarding the price of high-speed rail tickets being more expensive than other modes, making it difficult to actually uh, fulfill their whole potential. There's been another more specified uh, question <laughs> regarding, back to you, Jörg, also why did you not apply for the carbon credits through the UNFCCC? Um, my understanding was because it's actually uh, it pays off higher in the Korean uh, offset system, but maybe... No, that's not the reason, because you could have applied to the UNFCC and registered it as CER project, and then you could have issued it, it as KOC. That's also a path. We deliberately chose the domestic system uh, because we don't believe that the UNFCC can follow its own rules. So uh, the experience is simply that to get a project for you, even if you follow all the procedures, is very cumbersome and risky at the UNFCC. And it took us two years with the domestic system, but uh, we got it through there. It's, uh, it's also, if you have it as a domestic project, uh, and registered as a domestic project, you thereafter follow the rules of the domestic project system, which are in general not changing every year and not changing ex post. So it's more, far less risky as a project developer to go for domestic systems than to go for international trading systems. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? from participants. I, at the moment, I don't see any more. If not, then I think we uh, will close this webinar. And I would like to thank everyone for participating. I'd like to thank all uh, the speakers again, and also, of course, all the participants.